So the first thing I wanted to start with here was an update in the Sargon of Akkad uh, or Akila Hughes versus Sargon of Akkad case. You may remember that back in October or November, Morrison and Lee had requested default because Sargon had, quote unquote, not responded. Well, there's been an, a rather a series of updates in the case since then, starting with this November 24th letter from Michael Lee. This firm represents Akila Hughes. Carl Benjamin claims to be represented by Wesley Mullen. Mr. Mullen has not filed a notice of appearance, but claims to be representing defendant. Defendant claims he was improperly served in England with the complaint, but refuses to accept service or provide his home address, and therefore is necessitating this motion. Well, that's a little bit of, a, of, a, of an overstatement there. Morrison and Lee, Michael Lee is trying to get good service on him, sure, but that doesn't mean that there's like any requirement. Like, I don't have to help my opponent serve me. There's absolutely no requirement, at least not until a judge issues some kind of order. And then again, only if that judge has jurisdiction over the parties and the matter and the case and controversy and all that. So this is a tiny bit of an overstatement here, but let's continue. On August 25th, plaintiff filed the instant action against defendant. Plaintiff asserts a claim of copyright infringement. On September 11th, defendant was served with a copy of the complaint summons civil cover sheet Copyright Office Form AO121, ECF Filing Rules and Instructions, Your Honor's Individual Rules and Practices via Federal Express, and pursuant to Rule 4 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Defendant has failed to answer or otherwise move uh, in response to the complaint. The Clerk of Court entered a Certificate of Default on October 11th. Pursuant to Rule 55, plaintiff is entitled to a default judgment. However, on November 13th, 2017, I received a letter via email from Mr. Mullen, the letter, asserting that service on defendant was improper. Plaintiff is only aware of one address for defendant and served defendant at that address, which he previously identified as his own. For plaintiff to be informed that this sworn statement was not true came as a surprise. Additionally, Mr. Mullen accused this firm of wrongful conduct in obtaining the certificate of default because the FedEx confirmation lacked a signature. Plaintiff expressly denies any wrongful intent in obtaining the default. Nonetheless, in the interest of providing defendant an opportunity to appear and defend this action, we responded to the letter and agreed to stipulate to vacate the, at the certificate of default and asked if Mr. Mullen would accept service. In response to this request, Mr. Mullen claimed he was not authorized to accept service. This is normal. I do not accept service for many of my clients on purpose. Therefore, despite claiming service is insufficient, defendant has refused to provide an alternative address and is now willfully evading service. Instead of filing the order to show cause and wasting these, this court's resources, if defendant is going to oppose based on lack of service, plaintiff would like to ensure that defendant was properly served. Defendant who is located in England was served pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 4F2C2, in doing so, plaintiff relied on defendant's own sworn statement in his counter notice pursuant to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that he was residing at the address to which process was mailed. So what is Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 4F2C2? Let's take a look. Serving an individual in a foreign country. Unless federal law provides otherwise an individual other than a minor, an incompetent person, or a person whose waiver has been filed may be served at a place not within any judicial district of the United States by internationally agreed means that are reasonably calculated to give notice, such as those authorized by the Hague Convention on service abroad of judicial and extrajudicial doc documents. And there was actually a case this summer in the U.S. Supreme Court that held that you can serve people via mail if it is provided for in the Hague Convention and whatever their local law is. Permits service by process, 
service of process by mail, provided that the receiving state has not objected to service by mail, and service by mail is otherwise authorized. The court has made it easier for plaintiffs committing, commencing litigation in the U.S. to serve defendants located abroad. So what is service? Service is supposed to be the official notice of the lawsuit. It is a very important step in the procedure of a lawsuit, and it sets dates and preserves the, the, the notice of the claims to the defendant. So if Sargon's lawyer is responding that they know about the lawsuit and simply don't want to receive it formally, that almost sounds like they already know about it, and so they should just receive it formally. So a court could really agree that service is being evaded here. At the same time, you don't have any duty that I know of to assist the plaintiff in making their case, except maybe a little bit of discovery, but you don't have to show up somewhere and receive the documents by law or something. They have to follow the procedure and serve you properly. But apparently they can do it by mail. Sargon provided, an email, provided a mailing address, and they successfully mailed something to him. Now, is FedEx mail? I don't know. The judge might not agree that FedEx is mail. When I do service of process via mail, I use the mail. I don't use... Uh, uh, FedEx or UPS, I use the United States Postal Service and the official channels that that goes through. But let's, um, let's continue. Oh, yeah, I did want to go back there. In, uh, on many occasions, the district court has permitted service by email. You can, and basically the, the rest of that is you can have service by email. And so this is a letter motion request for service by email. Then on December 5th, we get another letter from Michael Lee. Defendant, despite being served with process at what he claims to be in a sworn statement was his address, now claims this is not his address. They claim this is willful evasion of service and request that they be given permission to serve via email. They go into some more factual background, which I think we've covered. Since defendant has knowingly provided a false address on a sworn statement, and since receipt of the letter, plaintiff has performed additional due diligence and cannot locate an alternative address, plaintiff respectfully requests permission to serve defendant via email. And then they go on to cite the reasons why they think you should be able to, to uh, serve via email. Basically, notice reasonably calculated under the circumstances to apprise interested parties of the pending litigation and afford them the opportunity for a meaningful response. That's what service is supposed to accomplish, which I think has been accomplished here. Sargon knows there's a lawsuit by now. Come on, guys, this is nothing new. So Morrison Lee or Michael Lee is, is, is understandably asking for, for ex expedition or, uh, yeah, expedition here. So then we finally get an on the record response, your honor. I, uh, Wesley Mullen, I think it is. Let's just check down here. Wesley Mullen. Yep. I represent defendant Carl Benjamin in the above captioned matter. I write in response to plaintiff's letter motion for an order permitting service by alternative means. He is not willfully evading service. Plaintiff has simply failed to properly serve him as required by rule four. Mr. Benjamin is a UK citizen resident in the UK who is not subject to personal jurisdiction before this court. He has no interest in assisting plaintiff in abusing US copyright law for the wrongful purpose of political retaliation. So I so advised counsel for plaintiff in correspondence that preceded plaintiff's letter motion. These letters also set forth the basis for defendant's anticipated motions to dismiss and for fees under the Copyright Act. My client would agree to a Rule 4D1 request to waive service directed to the undersigned. Waiving service is definitely something that you can do, and it usually buys you time. When you waive service under Rule D here, you usually get 60 days for the waiver to be returned and then 90 days to answer the complaint, something like that. So that aside, we're gonna see what the judge does with that because the judge then adds this paragraph here at the bottom. This is the judge's paragraph. 
As defendant appears willing to waive service, his date to answer or otherwise respond to the complaint would be 90 days after the receipt of the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 4D request to waive service. Defendant's waiver of service would seem to moot plaintiff's Rule 4F motion for email service. However, if plaintiff would like to respond, they shall do so no later than December 11th. So then here's December 11th. Michael Lee responds, Defendant forced plaintiff to make her motion for substituted service by refusing to provide a valid address for service. Defendant previously provided a false address. Yes, we've we've heard this before. And by refusing to allow his counsel to accept service on his behalf. Now, in response to this motion, defendant suddenly consents to waive service without any explanation for the unnecessary delay. It sounds like they're upset that... uh, that they didn't waive that that Sargon didn't waive service earlier. Despite defendant and his counsel's full knowledge that plaintiff was going to make her motion, they decided to waste plaintiff's and this court's time and resources. That said, in the interest of moving this litigation forward and avoiding any further delay and pursuant to defendant's consent, we shall direct a request for waiver of service pursuant to 4D to defendant's counsel for execution. So it sounds like they're a little bit upset here that Mr. Mullen didn't respond by waiving service earlier, and I almost wonder if this paragraph isn't calculated to also appease their own client who might be a little bit upset that she has to pay for all of this. Then we get this response from the judge on the 20th of December, just four days ago. Richard J. Sullivan, District Judge. The above titled matter has been assigned to my docket. On December 20th, plaintiff filed an executed waiver of service form, establishing a date to respond to the complaint of February 13th, 2018. Actually, didn't we just see that that was supposed to be 90 days? Like, if I come back here to the thing that I forgot to show you before, I think it's 90 days if it was sent to a defendant outside the judicial district of the United States. 90 days would be January, February, March. Right? Right. So, whatever. The judge says February 13th. Accordingly, it is hereby ordered that the party shall appear for an initial conference Friday, March 9th in Thurgood Thurgood Marshall Courthouse, Foley Square, New York, New York. It is further ordered that by March 1st, 2018, the party shall jointly submit a letter not to exceed five pages, a joint letter, providing the following information in separate paragraphs. One, a brief statement of the nature of the action and the principal defenses thereto, a brief explanation as to why the jurisdiction and venue lie in this court, a brief description of all outstanding motions and or outstanding requests to file motions, a brief description of any discovery that has already taken place and that which will be necessary for the parties to engage in meaningful settlement negotiations, a list of all prior settlement negotiations, including dates, parties involved, and a Approximate duration of discussions, estimated length of trial, and any other information that the parties believe is helpful. It is further ordered that by March 1st, the parties shall submit a proposed case management plan and scheduling order. The template is available at this link. Judge Sullivan. So that is what we can expect. Sometime in February, we can expect Mr. Mullen to answer on behalf of Sargon, and by March 1st, we can expect a complete letter to the judge with all of that information. It seems to me that service probably was pretty good under the new rules that the U.S. Supreme Court has has adopted and supports. Uh, What's unclear is whether FedEx was good enough, whether FedEx without a signature was good enough, and that all might be moot anyway because the judge has found some middle ground on this service issue and a waiver has been issued. So that's where we are there. The case is going to proceed. It is not being dismissed at this stage. The case is going to proceed to where Sargon's going to have to either answer or provide a motion to dismiss, probably based on lack of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, what would that be? Why did they sue him here in New York City? That's convenient for Morrison and Lee, but that is not at all convenient for Sargon. Does Sargon do enough business in New York that venue is proper in New York City? Does he have enough personal business in New York? I don't know. Uh, We're going to find out. We're going to hear their arguments one side and the other as to why 
jurisdiction belongs there. And we might have a longer conversation here on the channel about minimum contacts and international shoe and all that, the cases that define how a court determines which court has proper jurisdiction because it is super complicated and basically an entire course in law school. 